I mean, I went to college in the 60s. You know, that's what prompted me to, uh, to pursue this line of research because I saw that, you know, I went to an Ivy League school and I went to Stanford School of Medicine and, you know, I used cannabis and I don't think it destroyed my life. I'm Donald Abrams and I'm Chief of Hematology Oncology at San Francisco General Hospital and a Professor of Medicine at the University of California, San Francisco. In the clinic here at San Francisco General Hospital, we had uh, a volunteer, uh, Mary Rathbun, who was our Volunteer of the Year for two years in a row. She was an older woman and she used to bring her kids, as she called our patients, uh, marijuana brownies. Uh, this was at a time when we didn't have any effective therapies for HIV AIDS and many people were dying of the so-called wasting syndrome. I was in Amsterdam of all places at the International AIDS Conference and glancing at CNN headline news and I saw that Mary was being arrested in Sonoma for baking brownies for our patients. And when I arrived home there was a letter directed to the uh, director of research in the AIDS program at San Francisco General suggesting that a clinical trial showing the benefits of medical marijuana should come from Brownie Mary's institution, as if she were our dean. Uh, but, you know, I picked up the gauntlet and decided, well, that's a good idea. I had found out that the federal government, uh, the only legal source of cannabis for clinical trials, uh, being the National Institute on drug abuse was not interested or, or has a mandate from Congress that they cannot supply cannabis to study as a treatment. Because as Dr. Leshner told me when I met with him in 1996, he said, we are the National Institute on drug abuse, not for drug abuse. So they have a congressional mandate only to study substances of abuse as substances of abuse and hence could not give me marijuana to study to see if it reverse the AIDS wasting syndrome. In California, we were fortunate at the end of the last century to have a, a budget surplus. And with that, uh, Senator John Vasconcellos established a Center for Medicinal Cannabis Research at the University of California through appropriating three million dollars a year for three years. Uh, and that center was really developed to study uh, cannabis as a medicine. Uh, for the indications that the people of California had voted on in 1996. The federal government, again, deciding that they're the only legal source of, of cannabis, sort of made arrangements so that they would supply the marijuana for these research protocols, even though they were looking at marijuana's effectiveness, as long as they didn't have to pay to do the studies. So the state of California, the University of California Center for Medicinal Cannabis Research, would fund the research and NIDA would supply the marijuana, and so that was a big change. The, the potency of the cannabis that we get from NIDA, the National Institute on Drug Abuse, is, is low. Uh, averages about 3.5, maybe to 4 percent. Uh, and street cannabis, or cannabis that's uh, from the dispensaries, I think is 8 to 12 to 20 percent. So that, that's lower potency. I, I asked NIDA, can't you make more potent cannabis, you know, and they said, well, it turns out that it's too sticky and it, it gums up their machine because they automatically roll their uh, marijuana for research into cigarettes using Pall Mall cigarette paper. So, so they did actually for our vaporizer study, they came up with a 6.8% THC, um, which they managed, I don't know if they hand rolled it or, or what, but they, they did manage to make a more potent strain. A number of the studies that we did were on painful peripheral neuropathy because it's such a hard syndrome to treat and there aren't really effective therapies. Opioids don't really work. Acupuncture is plus minus. Most people use anti-seizure medicines and I think all the studies uh, from the uh, University of California Center for Medicinal Cannabis Research have shown that uh, cannabis is very useful for peripheral neuropathy. We took patients with chronic pain who were taking an opioid, either morphine extended release or oxycodone extended release, and we exposed them to vaporized cannabis for five days. And we looked at the impact on the level of the opioid, the morphine or the oxycodone, in their bloodstream and the impact on their pain. 
and we're in the process of writing that one up. But it was very interesting, and it supports what we thought was going to happen in that the blood levels of the opioid, either the morphine or the oxycodone, were actually decreased. But pain relief was increased with the cannabis. So, you know, that's a very interesting finding. Other studies have been conducted in patients with multiple sclerosis. Again, many patients with multiple sclerosis re report decrease in spasticity, decrease in pain, increased mobility, increased mood, improved mood uh, when uh, participating in these studies. We've done a lot of research over the past 20 years when we haven't been able to do research with the actual cannabis on how cannabinoids uh, cause their effects. And what investigators found in the 1970s and 80s was that uh, we have receptors in our body, uh, CB1 and CB2, uh, that complex with these cannabinoids from the plants. Now why would we, and all other animal species, mind you, have these CB1 receptors? It's not because we're meant to smoke marijuana. What we find out is that we have uh, our own circulating cannabinoid chemicals in our body that don't come from the plant. They're generally produced on demand and they complex with the receptor and they cause uh, biological action. So I drink green tea for its health benefit and green tea has a number of different chemicals that produce these benefits. Similarly, cannabis, the plant, uh, has a number of active compounds called cannabinoids and they belong to a family of 21 carbon chemicals that all have um, biologic activity. We believe that there are about 70 or 80 different cannabinoids in marijuana. The most well-known and the most psychoactive cannabinoid is Delta-9 THC, and that has been extracted from the plant and put in a sesame oil capsule and has been available as a drug, dronabinol, now for many years. However, there are other cannabinoids in the plant that have activity. A study in Israel looked at Delta-8 THC and found that it was equally effective as an anti-nausea drug for children with cancer getting chemotherapy. I think most of the interest now is on another uh, cannabinoid called cannabidiol, otherwise known as CBD. <clears throat> this cannabinoid seems to have really potent anti-inflammatory and anti-pain activity without having a psychological effect or without producing a high. It's a very exciting field and many drug companies are working to increase production of endocannabinoids or decrease production or block the cannabinoid receptor. Now, there was an example of a drug that was approved uh, to decrease appetite. It was approved in Europe and it was a CB1 receptor blocker so that the receptor could no longer uh, bind with the body's own endocannabinoids. And what they found was that by blocking that CB1 receptor that patients lost weight but they got depressed and they committed suicide and that was a bad side effect. So the drug was never approved here in the US and it's now been taken off the market in Europe. As an oncologist there's hardly a cancer patient that I see for whom I don't recommend cannabis because these are patients, especially those who are undergoing chemotherapy, who benefit from anti-nausea, increased appetite. We have many, many other anti-nausea drugs, but cannabis is the only drug that also increases appetite. And we know it decreases pain, again, especially in conjunction with opioids, helps people sleep better, and it decreases depression. So those are five reasons that a cancer patient might benefit from cannabis, and if I were not familiar with cannabis' medicinal properties, I would have to prescribe five different medicines, all of which would have side effects, toxicity, and cost. If this were something that we just discovered in the Amazon, you know, everybody would be knocking doors down to do clinical trials to investigate its potential because it is quite an amazing medicine. I mean, it, it is unfortunately all about politics and not science, and that's, when it comes to the health of the nation, I think a problem. Thank you.